Good morning and welcome to another in the Elephant series on the COVID-19 pandemic and various responses to it, especially as they affect Africa. Today, I'm very privileged to have with me um, a leading political, uh, African political scientist, uh, Dr. Ato Kwame Onoma, who is head of the research program uh, at the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, CODESRIA, that is based in uh, Dakar in Senegal. Uh, good morning, uh, Ato. I think it's, it should be around 9, 9.30, your time. Yes, you are right, John. Good morning. Thank good morning. Uh, thank you very much for making the time to, to, to join us uh, today. Uh, let me just start, uh, uh, Ato. Um, what's life like? Um, are you under lockdown in Dakar? Um, you know, what kind of measures have been implemented to deal with the pandemic? How serious is it and how has it affected your work? How's your family? Um, thanks, John. Um, I think we are doing well given the circumstances. Um, Dakar has um, just around 500 cases, but um, we've seen the gradual implementation of a series of measures. So um, there isn't a lockdown, but there is a curfew. There are um, laws against um, assemblies. Schools have been closed. Places of worship have been closed for a while. Um, Interregional travel within the country has been um, stopped. Um, and then, of course, the borders of the countries are, have been closed for a while now. So I have been working from home and um, um, trying to juggle working and then homeschooling and trying to stay sane. So um, it's challenging and interesting at the same time. Um, how are you and how is your work going? We are. How are yeah. Well, we're well, uh, you know, just very much like uh, yourselves. We, we have a curfew um, from uh, seven, 7 in the evening until the morning. Um, we also have a lockdown in effect. Uh, the, you know, the primary measure that the government has implemented is um, this physical distancing. So all restaurants have been closed. And, you know, Kenya is a is a country that depends heavily on uh, on tourism, um, and that sector more or less has, has shut down. Um, and um, we are allowed to we you know we're encouraged to go out. We go out to shop for groceries. When you do that, you wear a mask. It's mandatory now and enforced by the police. Um, everybody who goes outside must wear a mask. Um, you know, you wash your hands. You, as you go into a supermarket, you wash your hands. Uh, so, I mean, definitely in terms of behavior change, um, a range of measures have been implemented um, that, you know, we are learning from our, our brothers and sisters in the East and also in the West uh, as they respond to this crisis. So um, it's, it's um, you know, I was telling friends that, um, I actually um, had to spend 14 days in self-isolation because I flew into Kenya from um, from the US and the UK on the 13th of, of March, about two days before the curfew. And it was interesting, um, Ato, in that um, when I passed through uh, JFK airport in New York on the way here, the officials there were not wearing masks. There were a few people, mainly um, Asians, who were wearing masks in the airport. Um, I didn't see that meant much of that amongst officials at the airport. Same thing in Heathrow. Um, and it's only when I arrived in Nairobi uh, at the airport um, that the officials were wearing masks and gloves. Our temperatures were taken. I was asked where I had been, um, and my 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 name was taken, my mobile number was taken, my residence address was taken. Yeah, and, and I you know I spent 14 days not leaving um, the front, you know, the, the door of the house. So, um, you know, maybe that uh, uh, leads me to, to pose a question to you, uh, as a political scientist and, and somebody who's, you know, at a unique vantage point in being able to uh, view developments with, you know, 
around COVID-19 across the continent. How would you characterize the African um, reaction to, to this pandemic? Um, I mean, as I said, I, I got the sense that actually um, we were quicker um, than many uh, other parts of the world. The Asians were very quick, but when the Africans kicked in, um, partly because we know our own limitations, we, you know, we moved quite hard and we had a bit of infrastructure. In Kenya, the infrastructure that we were using of, of temperatures and all that comes out of the Ebola crisis, um, that kind of thing. But how, how, how would you characterize it, Ato? Yes, um, I think I, I entirely agree with you. Um, I mean, there are ways in which um, our, the measures that many countries have imposed are similar to those imposed elsewhere. So curfews, lockdowns, the use of a mask, and things like that. I think uh, the big difference has been with regards to temporality. You know, when you look at timing, you realize that many of our countries imposed those measures much, much earlier. Sometimes before they had any deaths, sometimes before they even had any confirmed cases. Um, and I think I have been impressed overall by um, the awareness of many of our governments that um, we may not have the capacity to deal with large numbers of cases. So our best bet is in slowing the spread of the disease. And I think that's what informs the speed with which we have um, imposed these measures. And I think, um, you know, this has, we have to take this with the weight that it requires because these measures are extremely costly, economically, extremely disruptive socially. So when you think about Kenya, for example, with its tourism and hospitality industries, shutting all of that down is a big thing. So these are big decisions that government have made and we hope that um, it will sort of spread, it will sort of um, slow down the spread of the disease so that before it gets too um, bad, we will be closer to a vaccine or to, to um, an approved cure. Let me ask a, a question that, that emerges out of a comment that you made when we were chatting earlier. You said that diseases happen. Epidemics and pandemics are made. Can you just throw some more light on what you meant when you said that? Um, I mean, so this is, I think this is something that is widely understood within the, the, the scholarly community that, you know, um, we have a case where, you know, uh, we have an infectious, infectious disease. We can understand that as a biologic, biomedical event. Um, but the responses around that, our reactions around that, what we broadly think of as epidemic control and prevention measures, these are social and political decisions that we are making. For example, are we going to lock down the economy or are we not going to? Are we going to impose the wearing of face masks or are we not going to? Are we going to try to prevent the virus from spreading or are we going to allow the virus to spread so that people develop immunity to it? You know, are we going to curtail trade to, to reduce the spread of the virus or are we not willing to do that and will allow trade that will lead the virus to spread more so these are all decisions that we make they are deliberate decisions and these are really what's built what we think of as an epidemic or as a pandemic so it's very useful to think of it as a social event instead of just as a biomedical event you mentioned there, just, um, in passing, um, you know, just the role uh, that academics and researchers and experts play. And um, you know, you, you're sitting there in Dakar, um, in, in the premier African um, so, social science research center in all the world. Um, Codestria is one that brings together the greatest concentration of minds into the social sciences on the planet as pertains to African people. And one of the questions that I wanted to put to you as a member of this fraternity of academics at this time, what opportunities and challenges does this pose to African academ academia? We've seen a trend, especially since the late 1980s with the structural adjustment and also very authoritarian leaders um, who, who have a disdain for the academy, 
um, a disdain for academics uh, who are who are called uh, dissidents and and uh, you know and so a lot of the brain drain that took place in many of our countries from the 80s and 90s was as a result of um, you know um, backward leaders essentially uh, afraid of their own um, academy. Um, does COVID uh, potentially promise a change to that? Uh, in that, you know, talking to different academics, which is what I've been trying, you know, we've been trying to do over the past um, few weeks, is to reach out to African experts so that we can nuance this pandemic and what it, what impact it's going to have politically, economically, and socially. Um, what you know, what does this pandemic mean for for your fraternity? Uh, for the academy, for experts, uh, for for um, respect of of um, the kind of thinking and nuancing and research um, that, that that you do. Okay, I mean maybe uh, let me start very uh, in very <laughs> very practical considerations of our lives now, and I think. The pandemic has been very disruptive to an extent because there are certain things that academics usually do that we can't do anymore. For example, going out to the field to do field research, for example, organizing conferences where we meet and discuss and things like that. But there, is, there are also ways in which um, the break is sort of propitious for academic work or intellectual labor because it's sort of, precisely because it sort of cops movement and a lot of other activities it gives people more of a time to sit and reflect and if what you do is write and read and you do have the books in your house or you have uh, access to them online then you can do a lot and i think um it is a good time to reflect and think and i mean for us as codestria when we think one of the things that we think about often almost always is the extent to which Africans are telling their own story. Yeah. And I think, um, yes, the pandemic does raise that question because we are talking about a pandemic, but really another way of, to think about this is that we have a series of epidemics happening in different places around the world simultaneously. Because the way it's, it's playing out in various places is very different. For example, you look at the population profile Many African countries are extremely young. Correct. Europe, you have large sections of the population that are extremely old. And so obviously the way the pandemic plays out in Europe will be very different from how it plays out in Africa. And we need people who, are, who know the continent to be able to understand and reflect on how it will play out in the continent. So it's very important. And I think... Um, like you said, for too long, we have sort of neglected academia or even um, cracked down on academia. We tend to see academics as people who are not too useful that we can neglect or even as troublemakers that we, we need to deal with. And these are not just historical um, attitudes. We see these attitudes even today in some countries where it's not just academics, but anyone who is willing to debate and to question is sort of seen as a problem. Yeah? There are still many of our countries where you have that. And it's not just the state, but sometimes it's market actors and things like that. And um, I think, you know, the continent sort of has to reflect on its relationship with those who produce knowledge about it in the continent. Okay. Um, because you know, one of the things we see with the pandemic is the importance of knowledge, the tentativeness of knowledge, and the importance of people who pose critical questions about what we think we know. And every society needs to have its share of people who, that, who do that sort of labor. It's important, just like we have um, our share of people who do leadership, our share of people who do economic activities, we do need people who are dedicated to intellectual labor. And it will be very difficult for us to understand and deal with many of these issues if we do not have people like that. Talk, talk, talking of the transience of, of, of knowledge, um, Dr. Ari, um, 
one of the one of the anecdotes or or, de- or current ongoing developments that, that is quite striking is, for example, uh, the the approach that has been taken to the pandemic by by the Tanzanian uh, president Magafuli, um, um, the approach that has been taken by the Swedish uh, government. Uh, which are quite different from what is being uh, adopted in other other European countries and what's happening in Tanzania is quite different from from what has happened in other African countries. Can can you can you, you know just comment and reflect on that in terms of um, nuancing um, approaches to to co to to the COVID nineteen pandemic? Okay, um, I think you know we we. Um, pandemics, just like with many important social um, crises, there are always alternative ways of approaching them. Um, the cost and benefits of each of these approaches are different. Um, I think it's also important to emphasize how much we still do not know yet. Okay, how much we still do not know. Yes. And I think once we have that in mind, we can be more tolerant to debate and to experimentation. You know, for example, a few weeks ago, we were told that um, you don't need a mask if you are healthy. Hmm? Yes. We were told that actually wearing a mask puts you in greater jeopardy. Yes. And just a few weeks later, we have many countries where if you don't wear a mask, you'll be fined by a police officer or even sent to jail or yes. put in quarantine because we believe that it's absolutely important for everyone to wear a mask. Huh? Um, you know, there is also a lot of questioning about immunity. We are still not sure whether those who suffer from the, the disease and recover have immunity, how long they have immunity for when, the, when immunity kicks in and all of that. So there are still a lot of things that we don't know in terms of scientific knowledge. But I think when you have crises like this, dealing with, with them requires marrying scientific knowledge with knowledge of local context. Yeah? So like I said, it's probably more useful to think of this as a series of epidemics that are happening simultaneously in many places. And the way they play out, the measures that will be... Um, appropriate to deal with them in different contexts will be will vary, and so I think once we know that um, the, the idea that there is one approach that will deal with the crisis is problematic, one because we don't know that much yet, but also because what might work in one place may not be work in another, and the cost that a society that might make sense for one society to accept may not make sense for another society to accept because its cost-benefit ratios can be calculated in very different ways because of local context. Yeah. So I think because of that, um, we probably should be more tolerant. Now, having said that, I think there are certain responses that we can say are problematic. So for example, we see, we still have um, people talking about having, having found a cure so the disease, asking people to go out and pray, um, you know, uh, maybe I should not let my anti-religious biases come into play in this. But I think um, some sorts of, some res- responses, especially when they are from opinion leaders and from leaders can be highly problematic, um, especially when they flout um, experiences that we have had with dealing with epidemics and pandemics like this going back into history okay because what we are using the toolkit that we are using to deal with this crisis is not just what we are discovering from this crisis it's also the legacy that we have from dealing with previous crises you know so the point you made about entering um getting to jkia and then getting um having your information taken and all of that that's a legacy of the Ebola crisis in DRC. Huh? And I think there are many African countries that have this legacy of experience of dealing with pandemics and epidemics that are bringing this to play, to 
quickly in this um, crisis. And so telling people that it's all right, you should just go and out and pray and it will help with this disease can be problematic, I would say. Um, one of one of the um, one of the aspects of the response that we've seen across Africa, which people are commenting on uh, more and more, has been the, the the securitization, the militarization of of, of the response. Um, what are the political and social? I mean, you know, first of all, what's your comment in in, in regard to this, and what, what, what can you foresee as being some of the consequences of this securitized, militarized uh, response mm -hmm. to what is essentially uh, a, a health uh, issue um, that, that, that has led to a response that has had such a major impact politically, economically, and socially? Um, I think, you know, going back to, you know, like what a pandemic is or what an epidemic is, if we, if we agree that these are major social political events, then it's unavoidable that the police will be involved, that the military will be involved, that law enforcement will be involved. And this is not unique to the COVID pandemic. If you think about the Ebola virus disease outbreak in West Africa, you had many of the important global power sending um, military teams that are specialists in dealing with biological hazards to those places. Yeah? And you see this sort of response everywhere because in you know, confining people, confining people is a political act. Yes. Yeah, it's a political act. Correct. And usually when you confine people, you are sending them to prison. Right now we have been confined in our places. Some of us are doing it willingly, others less willingly. And who are the specialists in confining people? <laughs> it's, it's law enforcement. Okay. Now, having said that, I think the relationship of the law and the state to our to societies and to people in our communities is something that has been debated forever. I think there, are, on one hand, there is a sense that African states are not capable they are weak they are and then they are on the other hand there is this um, understanding that african states can be extremely repressive and abusive in terms of how they deal with communities and i think in certain ways the pandemic provides a platform for the display of those relationships between the states and communities huh? and you know, you hear stories. I was reading an interesting story where the headline was that the police have killed more people than COVID in Nigeria. Mm. Mm. <laughs> or you have videos of police beating up people, brutalizing people and all of that. And, and so, you know, in a sense, um, we have another situation where we are, we are sort of displaying or performing this relationship. But it's also interesting because the pandemic is providing new opportunities um, to develop the capacity to control people. And it's not just in Africa, it's across the world. For example, there is massive gathering of data on people that can be useful for dealing with the pandemics, but that can be useful for controlling society for other means um, or towards other ends as well. And I think these are issues that we have to think about. Certainly, um, life after COVID will not be exactly the same as life before or during COVID. But the ways in which it will change and the ways in which it will remain the same, I think, are probably some of the important questions that, as social scientists, we need to reflect on. Um, th th thanks, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Ato. Um, if, if I, if you know, if, if I was to ask, I mean, one of the areas of speciality. Um, in terms of your own research in, in the past has been just, uh, you know, intra-Africa migration. There's a lot uh, of airtime consumed, particularly in the West, with the migration of Africans into Europe, into America, etc. Uh, but actually the majority of immigration um, takes place by Africans, takes, takes place within Africa, um, with all its opportunities and risks and challenges. Um, how, how do you think this particular critical demographic 
uh, in our societies is uh, is being impacted. With the borders closed, you have uh, large groups of refugees, in particular, whose whose um, status within countries is 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 not clear. And and how how is that? Uh, you know, what 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 would be your your comment on that, given your experience in this area? Yeah, I mean, so the 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 border closures. Um, have been extremely disruptive for the lives of many people because there are many people, especially in frontier regions um, in our countries that live between countries. So they may live in one country and go farm in another country or live in one country, but to go send an email, they have to cross the border to another country or to go to the market, they have to cross to another country or to go do their rituals, they have to cross to another country. And it's true that this is something that happens all around the world. We do have that a lot in Africa. And when you think about borders that are closed, it's going to be extremely disruptive to the lives of many, many people. And I'm talking about people for whom crossing borders is just part of their quotidian. So they are not people going on long distance trade or going to visit a relative. It's just what they do every day. Um, having said that, I think we probably need to reflect to give more attention to refugees and forced migrants, mm. displaced people. Mm. Um, because, um, and I think this is something that we need to do across the world because a lot of the, the if, you, if you look at it, states are basically taking care of their people. So even when they close borders, a lot of the time they allow their own citizens to come in. Huh? And if you look at a lot of the measures that we are imposing, a lot of the time they assume a form of existence that is not valid for many of these refugees and forced migrants, okay? Um, and to this, you can add other people who are basically socially disadvantaged, uh, who, are, who don't have the citizenship rights that we assume that many people have in our societies, okay? So they have very, very precarious lives. If you go to many refugee camps and comes for displaced people, health facilities are almost non-existent. Yes. Huh? Um, we are talking about ventilators and things like that. But for many people in those places, it's about how you will um, recover from diarrhea or from malaria or other diseases um, that are more common in our countries. Um, we think about people staying home. Many people have extremely precarious lives and the idea of staying home, sometimes they don't even have a home. Mm -hmm. So where are they going to stay? That's you know, right. Thinking about social distancing, if you go to many of those camps, people are really crowded into very tiny spaces. Many of those camps don't have water. They don't have, you know, so um, a lot of these are things that are I'm actually for disadvantaged communities. And in many of our countries, the most disadvantaged are often forced migrants. Um, um, what what would you say is going to be the 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 impact of COVID, or what could be? You know, where are the opportunities that emerge out of this COVID pan, pan, uh, pandemic? Um, you know, my I don't know. I'm, it's too early to tell, but um, uh, there are those who are concerned that some of the some of the new measures that have been implemented to to respond to the uh, to the pandemic, especially those measures that restrict people's personal freedoms, uh, may have a, a measure of resilience that some of these measures, once implemented, are difficult to to remove. Uh, so I wanted to to, to seek your comment uh, on that, uh, but just to tie that up with another question, which is: to what extent does this uh, help to wake up um, uh, African leadership about the need to invest much more deliberately and in a much more serious, uh, transparent way in their health systems, in their education systems. Because right now, uh, many of our leaders are stuck in uh, our capitals, unable to jump onto their jets to fly to, to Europe for treatment. If you get coronavirus, you have to be treated at home. And in many of our countries, we have you know, weak health systems. 
uh, and sometimes, you know, like in a place like Kenya, it's not only we, but it's also fragmented. So we have a mixture of private and public, and um, and, and a slow, um, you know, uh, sort of decline in, in 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 seriousness in which the government interacts with the public health uh, area as a whole. So I'll, I'll be keen for your for your opinions on that. Um. Thank you. I mean, I think, you know, one of the interesting things about this crisis is that they keep on reminding us about um, persistent problems. Mm -hmm. And they keep on showing us um, the dangers of those sorts of problems. Okay, so for example, you talk about, you know, early on we talked about our knowledge production systems. And when you think about this, um, important components, of course, are the educational systems, schools, universities, and things like that. And um, we sort of heavily disinvested in this in the 1980s, in the 1990s, um, because, you know, we've sort of had um, an interesting trajectory in these universities. So if you take University of Nairobi, or Dar es Salaam, or Makarere, or University of Ghana, or University of Ibadan, in the 1950s, 1960s, 1950s, for those that were in existence then, or 1960s, even 1970s, these were sort of universities of excellence, mm -hmm. where you had the brightest African minds, often even the brightest people of studying Africa from around the world teaching in those places and doing research there as their primary places of uh, work. If you look at many of those universities, they are no longer in, those, in that place. Yes. And a lot of it has to do with the slow decline of African states, with the economic crisis, political crisis. But a lot of it was also just deliberate decisions made during um, our structural adjustment programs. There has been an interest in sort of rebuilding this, but I don't think we have, first of all, realized how big the challenge is and how big the problem is. Second, we are, haven't been willing to put in all the resources that are required. And third, some of the measures that we are taking are not necessarily the right measures in the sense that the people that are involved in this debate are not necessarily, the voices that are often heard in this debate are not necessarily the voices of people that are really implicated in those spaces. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to rethink this. It's the same with our health systems. We can think also about growing inequality. It's true that in many African countries, less people are poor, but there is growing inequality and inequality has fundamental impact in all aspects of life. And we see it, you know, in how we are trying to deal with the COVID pandemic. In many countries, they cannot have lockdowns, even though leaders want to, because many people will just starve. And so far more people will die from dealing with the disease than from just allowing the disease to, to evolve huh, in society. And so these issues of poverty, of inequality, of health systems that don't work well, of educational system, I think that um, we are once again reminded that we should pay attention to. Will we do that? It's not clear. I mean, it's not obvious that this crisis will lead us to. I mean, you know, our countries have faced many crises in the past and they haven't necessarily led to the change that we desire. So there is a political struggle. And I think one of the things that I hope will come out of this is a greater determination of, of populations and active political communities in these countries to fight for change. It's a fight that has been going on for a while, but it's one that we have to continue to, 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 to pursue because um, the cost of not pursuing those struggles is just too high. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you, um, Kwame. Final, final question. This pandemic comes at a time when uh, the African Union has been discussing uh, African free trade area. Uh, in East Africa, we're talking about political federation, et cetera, et cetera. How, you know, just your crystal ball uh, as we close. Uh, if you looked at it and said, you know, what are the, you know, what are the, 
what would be the ideal uh, uh, response to COVID-19 in terms of the, the grand project of African unity? I'm talking about the ideal, and of course, it is tempered by the reality of, of our history and, uh, and existing knowledge. Um, I think, you know, there has been agreements for a while in um, large sections of the continent that greater unity and coming together is probably good for the continent on many fronts. Um, it's political, it's economic. Um, I think in terms of dealing with health crisis, it's obvious that um, if we could coordinate our responses better and things like that, it will help. Um, I think the question is, um, it's about continuing to work on surmounting problems. Okay. Um, I, don't, I think I'm one of those people that tends to be optimistic. I'm very aware of the problems of the continent, but I'm also optimistic. And maybe that comes from my training in comparative politics, because a lot of the time I think we tend to particular, particularize problems that are not unique to the continent. So integration is a hard thing. Um, it's hard to achieve. Once it's achieved, it's not something that you keep forever. It rolls back and all of that. Even with this COVID, people are talking about the European project. Just before COVID, there was Brexit and all of that. So um, I think, you know, like I said before, these are things that we have to work at. And even once we achieve them, there are things that we have to keep fighting to, to, to have every day. Because it, these are things that are really hard to achieve. And once you achieve them, they are really hard to keep. And so we have to keep fighting. One of the things that is obvious is that the cost of not having them is extremely high. And so whatever sacrifice we can make to achieve them in terms of activism is something that we should, we should invest in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ato Onoma. Uh, Head of Research at the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, Cordestria, from Dakar. Uh, Asante Sana for, for giving us uh, an hour of your morning to share these brilliant insights with us. Asante Sana. Karibu Sana. Kwaeri ya Asante Sana.